probably every one of you here has had an EKG at some point in your life. So what I'm going to talk about first is um, the anatomy and physiology of the heart. So, ooh, uh, this is one of my favorite lectures to give because we do give it at a rehab um, to let you know kind of like, well, why are we doing what we're doing? It doesn't make any sense to do something if you have no idea why you're doing it. What we're doing here is to make this muscle here that we all have healthier. So this is a diagram of a heart muscle. Your heart is about the size of a fist, your fist, because it all everyone's got different sizes of hearts. Um, the heart is a muscle, it's a hollow organ, and it's separated into four chambers. The top are called atria, the bottom are called ventricles. That pump needs its own circulation to survive. So just like you've got arteries and veins throughout your body to deliver the blood everywhere, your heart's got its own set of arteries and veins. So those are depicted in these little red and blue little like um, vessels on top of that heart muscle. So the red ones deliver the blood with the oxygen to the heart muscle, and the veins deliver it back to the bloodstream to help it get reoxygenated. So when we talk about heart disease, we can talk about several things. We can talk about something going on with the plumbing, the vessels that deliver the blood itself. We can talk about electrical problems, when the electricity that tells the heart to beat goes haywire for some reason. Or we can talk about parts. There are valves inside your heart that oftentimes don't work very well. So valves, you know, you've probably heard of mitral regurgitation, atrial or aortic stenosis. Those are some terms that we often hear in cardiac rehab that can happen to patients and require surgery or interventions. So, Coronary artery disease forms by plaque and cholesterol forming inside those little, I call it plumbing, or the arteries that feed the heart. A heart attack occurs when one of those arteries blocks up, or a piece of, piece of the cholesterol or plaque breaks off and causes a blockage, or a clot forms and fills that artery. It's called a heart attack. Anybody familiar with that term? Pretty much everyone's heard of the word heart attack formerly myocardial infarction. Sounds even scarier. So what happens is, is um, the blood, say for instance, you've got, is there a little pointer in this thing? Um, I don't know what I I'll use my pointer here. <laughs> <laughs> so say we're looking at this artery here. This is the left anterior descending. Say there's a blockage there and the blood can't flow down to this part of the heart. If blood can't get past a blockage, it's called a heart attack. And that tissue actually dies off. Then what happens? When you turn, we can't. You can't hear, okay, okay, so I'll come up a little closer too. So when there's a lack of blood flow to that heart muscle, part of that heart muscle dies off, and so you've got a weaker heart muscle. If too much damage occurs, it can cause heart failure, which means the heart cannot pump sufficiently to move the blood around. Well, why do we need to know all this stuff behind exercise? Well, when you exercise, it's, it's helpful for the heart in many ways. It's also helpful for the rest of the body, too. So let's look at this next slide. First of all, I should ask if there's any questions on the anatomy and the physiology. It can get pretty wordy. Yes? Congestive heart failure. Good question. Congestive heart failure means for some reason the heart is not able to get the blood moving around in the body like it's supposed to. It doesn't mean the heart stops. The heart can stop for many reasons, but it means that the heart is weaker or there's a defect in the blood flow through the heart somewhere. Maybe a valve is not working properly. But what it ends up is, a person can develop swelling in their legs, swelling in their belly, and ultimately fluid in the lungs, making someone short of breath. So what that requires is medicine to help keep the blood pressure under control, <coughs> help augment or facilitate the function of the heart itself, and keep the fluid out of the body. Any more questions? Does the diuretic do that, or is it no? Oh, yes, a diuretic helps get the fluid out of the body. Excellent question. Yeah, because heart failure is it's a sticky wicket, so to speak. It's one of those disease processes where it's very hard to keep it controlled because it requires not only medicine, but it requires a lot of work on behalf of the patient who has it to help change their lifestyle. They have to limit their sodium or their salt intake. They have to weigh themselves every day. They have to watch their bodies for any swelling. 
for fullness in the abdomen, and of course, shortness of breath. They need to report those symptoms to their doctor. Sometimes it requires an adjustment in medication. Any other questions on that? That's a good one. Yes? I've, I've heard the term heart, congestive heart failure, and the term failure just means immediately that the heart stops. Failing. Yes. But I've known people who've been diagnosed with congestive heart failure and they've lived for a long time. Yes, and you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a scary term because failure sounds like boom, it's going to stop tomorrow. Yeah. Well, some people, they have very serious heart failure and it does lead to serious problems almost to the point that we, we've had a couple of patients that have had to have heart transplants because the heart can no longer function. But before that, you know, um, a person can have a heart pump that can be put in to help augment or help support the heart as, it, as they're waiting or sometimes they live with those heart pumps until the end of life. But a lot of people can live with it for a long time, yes. But um, sometimes it can progress rapidly. It can also happen not just because of a heart attack. People can get heart failure from an infection. Sometimes someone can get like a bronchitis that attacks the heart muscle itself and can cause heart failure. And again, sometimes it's a valve problem. A person gets the valve repaired or replaced and it can help fix the problem. But there can be many reasons for heart failure. Good question. What about Atrial fibrillation, now that's a problem with the electrical system in the heart. What that means is, up here at the top part, those are called the atria, the top part of the heart, and the bottom are the ventricles. Atrial fibrillation is when the electrical system in the top part of the heart does not function properly. There is a natural pacemaker inside your heart called the sinoatrial node. It sends a signal to the bottom part of the heart to beat about 60 to 80 beats per minute. Sometimes, for whatever reason, there can be many, many little electrical signals that are firing off at the top part of the heart called fibrillation. So the top part of the heart, instead of beating nicely, it quivers like this. So atrial fibrillation requires medication to help slow down the heart. Sometimes a doctor will recommend a cardioversion where they put a shock to the heart to make it go back into a regular rhythm. Sometimes they'll have to do laser therapy and try to kind of like burn out those areas that are not functioning properly. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on. Oops, I just gotta go this way. <laughs> there we go. Okay, maybe I can have you guys tell me some things before we look at the slide. I just like to hear um, benefits of exercise. Anybody just tell me what you've heard, just like in hearsay or watching TV or reading the paper. What's a benefit of exercise? Weight control. Mm -hmm. Yes? Don't be shy. <laughs> it gives you uh, memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are certain good ones. So now we'll go to the slide. First of all, and these are not in any particular order, helps control blood pressure. Why is that? Well, the blood vessels when you're exercising in your body expand to help deliver the blood to the body and to the muscles while you're exercising. And it helps them expand, and then there's an overall decrease in your blood pressure that lasts for several hours after your exercise session. So, why do we care about blood pressure? When your blood pressure is elevated, it puts stress on those arteries and ultimately stress on the heart. Your heart system is a closed system. There's no openings where the pressure can be released, correct? The heart's always pumping, always pumping, and those vessels are closed. There's no leaking or, or a, a valve to release pressure. So if you tend to have higher blood pressure, dilating those vessels is very beneficial because it helps open up the space for that blood to be in, so to speak. So it decreases the pressure. Prevents another heart attack from happening by 50%. That's based on research that's been done. A lot of this information I took right off the American Heart Association website, which is chock-a-block full of good information about managing your heart health. Anything you have questions about, you can search on that website. It's very helpful. Improves your heart function by increasing circulation to the muscles in your arms and legs. Now we're going to get down to the really nitty gritty of exercise physiology. But I had to memorize all this. So this, you're getting my $10,000 worth of information in just five minutes here. <laughs> when you exercise,
exercise, there are little changes that happen in your body at a microscopic level. Number one is the blood gets more efficient or the body gets more efficient at pulling the oxygen out of the blood as it goes by. More efficient. The other thing is that you get a little extra mitochondria in each little cell in response to the exercise challenge to the body. Those little mitochondria are your little powerhouses in your body that your cells depend on for life and for energy. So that's what exercise does. And it happens in the periphery. So as a result, it helps improve the heart health. Exercise doesn't necessarily make the heart stronger, but indirectly the effects are from what's happening in the body, the muscular, the muscular system and the vascular system. Number four, improves mood and decreases stress. That's also been found through studies as well. These are studies that people report on paper, like, you know, uh, um, a researcher will say, we'll hand out these little, these little surveys and say, you know, what's your mood? Rate it today. And then they'll do the study and have the participants exercise and have them re-rate it. So it's not something you can measure with a measuring stick or a blood pressure cuff necessarily, but it's how someone reports how they're feeling. And it has been found um, to be true. I don't know if any of you have ever, you know, found that you're just having a bad, blah day and you go out for a walk and you see how beautiful it is, you hear the birds singing, the sun's on your skin, and your mood is just instantly lifted afterwards. That's the effect. Some people get a little bit of what's called an endorphin rush, where there's a chemical response in the body to the exercise that makes them feel as well and better as well. Improves cholesterol levels. Well, why do we care about cholesterol levels? Does anybody tell me? Okay, I'll tell you. I'm sorry. What you say? involved in plaque formation, and plaque formation is what leads to heart disease, which leads to heart attacks, correct? Yeah, so it helps reduce those cholesterol levels. Helps control blood sugar levels. As, you know, as time goes on, we've been noticing more and more incidences of type 2 diabetes in the United States, okay? Um, it's due to a lot of factors, you know, bad dietary habits are one of them, certainly. Um, Obesity is another factor in diabetes type 2, but it has been found through exercise that exercise helps control blood sugar levels. This is very important, and how it happens is, is when you exercise, your cells get more receptive. Come on in. It gets more receptive to the insulin that your pancreas is making. So it allows the blood sugar that's circulating to come into the cells for your energy and reduces that blood glucose level. Why do we care? What happens when you've got diabetes and you've got chronic and elevated blood sugar levels? What can happen to your body? It shuts down. Pardon me? It shuts down. It shuts down, but what are some of the other things that you've read about or heard? Blood out, accident, <coughs> what we missed? Kidney function can ruin your kidneys if you've got diabetes. Your eyesight, heart attacks, very commonly linked with diabetes type 2. Circulation in your extremities can be affected. All sorts of things can be affected. So it, it's very important to help keep the blood sugar under control. Of course, in conjunction with your doctor, you want to make sure that you're on the proper medication and you're adding exercise as directed by your physician. Um, oftentimes, we see where I work, when someone comes in who's been exercise naive, has not been exercising at all, all of a sudden they start a regular exercise program, they find that their blood sugars start to come down, and they keep coming down, and keep coming down, and then finally the doctor says, hey, your sugars are coming so low, let's drop back a little bit on your medicine. So who likes taking medicine, said anybody, never. <laughs> Why not, you know, help, if it's helpful in decreasing your medication, that's a win-win. That's a all right, improves balance and bone density. Someone said improves the muscles. Who said it? Somebody already said that. Is that you? Okay. Yeah, improves balance and bone density. Well, <clears throat> why do we care about how dense our bones are as we get older? So they don't break. Yup. You take a tumble. We're very at risk. The older we get, the less the less dense, the more porous our muscle our, our bones get, and we're more at risk for injury when we fall, particularly hip fractures. Um, 
and also balance. Balance is very important too because as we get older, our vision changes, our posture sometimes change. We tend to get more of a forward lean because we're looking down to watch where we're walking. And so balance is very key. So we can, you know, if we you know, get a little shuffle or somebody bumps into us, we're more um, adept at keeping upright. Um, muscle strength is very important as well. As we get older, our muscles decrease in size. We get more proportion of fat in our bodies versus muscle. So it's very important to exercise to help maintain your muscle mass. Because again, it helps you get through your day, get your things done, right? Muscle also takes up less space than fat. So we look a little trimmer if we're thinking about appearance. Improves quality of life. That's another thing that um, is measured through surveys and through, through self-report in participants in research studies. That people feel better, feel more vibrant, feel that they can do more things that they're interested in doing when they're regular exercising. Any questions there? I like that picture. Okay, so starting an exercise program, um, anybody here exercise regularly? It's usually the crowd that shows up for the lecture that's already <laughs> exercising. Yay! <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, check with your doctor before beginning any exercise program. It makes sense. As we get older, we are more at risk for chronic disease conditions. You want to make sure you're following up your doctor appropriately and following their advice. Oftentimes, a doctor will have you do a stress test before you get started on an exercise program based on your symptoms, based on your health history. So and this also, this information is not a substitute for your doctor's you know, prescriptions or you know, advice. This is just general guidelines for exercise. So wear non-restrictive comfy clothing and good supportive shoes. If you have a pair of Converse, you're one of those hipsters that wears those Converse, not a real good shoe to exercise in, nor is a shoe without a strap on the back. I do sometimes get patients that come into the gym, they've got those Crocs on, with no, no straps in the back, mm, pet peeve. You wanna make sure you're being safe when you're exercising, and that includes dressing safely too. When you're dressed in comfortable clothing, you're more able to move your body. When you're wearing sufficient shoes, these are good ones here, these New Balance. Wearing sufficient shoe wear, it helps protect from injuries in your lower extremities and also up in your hips as well because if something's going on with the feet that can radiate right up your body, your hips as well. Pick it to exercise that you like to do. I don't know anybody who's going to be a regular exercise does something they don't like to do because it just doesn't make sense. If it's going to be a slog, you're not going to continue doing it. So I'd like to hear what some of you do for exercise that you enjoy. Don't be shy. Walking and go. Walking. Mm -hmm. Play water volleyball. Water volleyball, that's really good for the shoulder motion too. You play it here? Yeah. Wow, that's, you got a good job, Cindy. Probably, probably don't do it often enough, I just do one a week. <laughs> water volleyball is great for overhead motion because this is one of these things that we tend to lose the ability to do is push our, our arms up over our heads. What were you going to say? We have the bowling pads and we have regular exercises there. And we sign up for them and we do those at least three times a week. Excellent. And I like how you said that, three times a week. So how many days a week do you think you should be exercising? Five. At least five, yep. What were you going to say? Every day. Every day, yeah. What were you going to say? Oh, you didn't? Oh, I thought you said something. Yeah, the American Heart Association and the American College of Sports Medicine, those are two big bodies of exercise information that you can, you can use for your information. They both recommend um, exercise at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise on most, if not all, days of the week. If you have diabetes, it's important to do it every day. You kind of consider it part of your medical treatment plan, you know, to keep your blood sugars regulated. And if you have diabetes, exercising at the same time every day allows your body to regulate around what you're doing because your sugars can fluctuate. So it's good to do it at a regular time. So, excellent. Three days a week. Basically, when you're doing three days a week, you're maintaining your fitness levels. It's better to keep it at least five. 
other types of exercise besides walking and aerobics classes and uh, water volleyball? Anything else that you do here? I like the elliptical. The elliptical it trainer. Seems like you're doing everything at once. Yes, you're using your arms and your legs. It's a low high intensity exercise. It might not be for everybody. We're all at different levels of our exercise ability. But my rule of thumb is something's better than nothing. Because if you're moving, you're starting your exercise program. And we'll talk a little bit more about how intense should our exercise be. Anything else? So I got elliptical, I got walking, I got volleyball. Someone else mentioned new step. New step. Yep, that's a great one if you've got back or knee issues. Excellent. Anyone else got a favorite exercise? Oh, okay. So do you have a bar that you use for the balance class? Mm -hmm. That's excellent too. Anybody else want to throw in their exercise? Line dancing. Line dancing. You have that here too? Yeah. God, I want to join. <laughs> Are you the one that signs all that stuff up? Most, most of it, yeah. The line, wow. line dancing is resident-led, so they mm -hmm. have an outside instructor that comes in and does line dancing. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Exercise with friends. It'll keep you accountable, and it's fun. Some people, a lot of patients I hear report say, like, oh, I'm just, it's so boring. I just can't do it. But if you have someone that you make an exercise appointment with, like say, hey, let's go to that class at 9. It's really good. Or um, let's meet at the gym. We have a gym here, correct? Mm -hmm. Let's meet at the gym at 10 and go through our exercise resistance training together. That way, you know, it keeps it light. You know, it takes your mind off of your tedium that comes with the exercise. You know, because sometimes it is boring. You're doing it every day, and you know, there are days where you just don't feel like doing it. So, I, I personally listen to a headset, but I don't recommend it for those who are exercising outdoors for safety reasons, because if you cannot hear cars coming behind you, especially electric cars, they sneak up on you. <laughs> um, and for you know, safety, so you're aware of your surroundings while you're exercising, I always recommend that. And keeping an ID on you when you're exercising outside is another key thing to do. If you've got a bracelet with your name on it, um, keeping your ID with you is important. So God forbid something happened while you're outdoors exercising on your own, you've got your ID with you. The next one kind of adds on to the safety factor. Carry your phone with you and let someone know where you are. You ever read in People magazine about someone out hiking in a mountain somewhere and didn't tell anybody where they were? Something happened and no one was able to get to them because nobody knew where they were. So, probably not all hiking mountains here. If you are, God bless you. <laughs> but carrying the phone, nice, easy way to call for help if something happens. Um, another thing is the phone is very handy. If you have a smartphone, some people like to track their exercise keep them accountable, but also it's like a little badge of honor to, to check, say, hey, I walked two miles today. And you can put it on your little apps. There's a, a plethora of apps that are available. If there are any questions about those, Tiffany is always a good resource for um, helping you with your smartphone if you want to experiment with one of those apps that they've got on there. My don't section. Don't exercise vigorously after a heavy meal. Why is that? Besides, your mother told you never to do that. You never go swimming after your heavy meal, right? <laughs> well, your blood goes to your gut to help digest after you've eaten a meal. So you've got to allow the blood to have time to come back to the heart. Because remember, that heart needs its own circulation to survive. We don't want to deny it the circulation it needs by having it all go to your gut. That's why you get a cramp, because if you're trying to exercise, the blood's diverted to the gut, it's not allowed anywhere else. And then, then also, you know, it's uncomfortable for that belly to work at the same time you're doing your exercise. Don't exercise outside if it's hot or humid. The heart's got to work harder to cope with an environment like that. When it's too hot, your body has to vasodilate to help release the heat. And if you're on any blood pressure medications, which already are helping dilate those arteries, it can make it worse. Don't exercise if you don't feel good. That kind of makes sense. If you're not feeling well, it's your body telling you something is trying to heal itself. You know, so you've got a cold or bronchitis. Um, if you don't feel well, if you've got chest discomfort, certainly don't exercise. That's a sign something's going on with the heart, and it's probably indicating not advice at all to exercise when you've got chest discomfort. We'll talk a little bit more on that next slide. Um, we already talked about 
Let's talk about the difference between two types of exercise. So it's cardiovascular exercise and strength training. Can anybody tell me the difference between those two? Yeah, 40 total, if you include your warm-up and cool-down. 
But like I said, you don't want to, if you've not been exercising regularly, you don't want to jump into that all at once. You want to add on gradually. Allow that body to adapt to the challenges you're giving it. They've had some sort of heart-related event. Either they had a blockage that a doctor put a stent in to help the blood flow through, or they've had a heart attack and they're recuperating. Um, maybe they have other blockages that they don't know about. Um, sometimes illnesses happen. You know, we're, we're in a pandemic here. Um, so these are signs and symptoms to stop exercise. Extreme shortness of breath. That shouldn't happen. You should be feeling like you're breathing, breathing a little heavier than just sitting here at a table, but you should not be gasping for air. Chest pain. Like I said, if you're having chest discomfort, do not start your exercise. You need to be letting your doctor know. Sometimes doctors will prescribe nitroglycerin to their patients that they're aware they're having angina or chest pain here and there, but that is a discussion to have with your doctor um, regarding nitroglycerin use. So rule of thumb, chest pain, do not start exercising, let your doctor know. If you're out exercising and the chest pain occurs, what do you think you should do? Stop exercise. And if it, the chest pain doesn't go away when you're, you're exercising, what should you do? Well, that's one of the things. <laughs> Call 911. Yeah, chest pain is not a normal experience we have. It's not, it's a warning sign. So, but that's, yeah, that's what you often hear too. Sometimes chest pain, take an aspirin because it does help in immediate um, treatment of heart attacks, but calling 911 and getting the ambulance crew out there to continue with the advanced life support and advanced treatment is very key. Time is very key. Yes? What causes rapid heart rate? Rapid heart rate can happen from lots of things. Um, when you're exercising, you've probably noticed when you're sitting at rest, your heart rate is anywhere between 60 and 80, typically. When you exercise, that heart rate will increase based on, well, what medicines are you on? I already said people with heart disease most likely have a medication that affects their heart rate. But rapid heart rate can happen from lots of things. Atrial fibrillation was one of them. Well, she's not. I'm sorry? It's like your heart was just a. Yeah. She wasn't exercising. It was in the middle of the night. Okay. Okay, and it stopped on its own? No, it was in the hospital because they did absolutely nothing. But they say it was. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> heart's a funny thing. Yeah. Yeah. The electrical, the electrical system of the heart is very complex, and a rapid heart rate like that can be caused by many things. Sometimes it can be from up on the atria where it just does it briefly and then it stops on its own. But it was good that you went and sought help because Oftentimes, a doctor, if this happens frequently and you go get seen anywhere, sometimes they'll put a heart monitor on you for two weeks to see what's going on. Did they do that? No, they suggested it, but that was the one time I had to do that back in the 80s. Oh, okay. And had an EKG after and that, and everything is. Okay. Sometimes they'll do the EKG after it's done and they see nothing. Yeah. That's why the reason for the two week heart monitor, they can grab it. They can, they're monitoring the heart for two weeks consistently. And the heart does things all day long. I don't have irregular beats here and there. I can feel mine skipping once in a while. Um, but who knows? Sometimes it's just a little blip in the electrical system. Sometimes it can be so many things. It, in a doctor, oftentimes they say, you know, but that monitor will help them catch it and they can see, well, is it something from the top part of the heart causing that? Or is it something from the bottom part of the heart? So the electrical system, like I said, very tricky. And it requires you know, an electrophysiologist, a specialist in the electrical system sometimes to figure out what's going on and what treatment's necessary. Well, my heart doctor, I talked to him and he said he didn't think at this time, since that was the one time only mm -hmm. thing. Well, it's good you sought help. Oh, yeah. Anything unusual. Typically, I find people who are exercising are a little more tuned in to what's going on with their body than people who don't, because you're taking care of your body. Um, but that, yeah, that's a really good question. Well, what scared me was I had a aortic valve replacement nine years ago. The doctor said, well, it takes two years. So yeah, nine take years. Two. <laughs> <laughs> right? Is it going to chime when it's ready? <laughs> um, yeah, that's just kind of a guesstimation. 
that they give you. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure. How do you know if your bowel is going bad? Um, you would start having symptoms like being short of breath, being more tired than usual, um, lightheaded, dizzy sometimes, but it's usually a vague thing that happens. So as, you know, as a bowel is starting to wear out, it would be more vague. So that's why you see your doctor six to six months every year. Every year. Six months. Mm -hmm. every yeah. Year. Yeah, noticing subtle changes like shortness of breath or fatigue are the ones that we usually see when those bowels aren't working very well. That's swelling in your legs. Mm -hmm. Yep, you probably notice the same thing. And you might notice swelling in your ankles too because of check it all the time, so we're not. You're so good. <laughs> Any other questions? Before moving on? Okay. Um, dizziness or lightheadedness? Well, that can be a sign of a lot of things going on. But basically, it means there's not enough blood getting up to that head. And the head needs blood, the major organs need blood. And of course, if you're dizzy or lightheaded, you're working too hard, you need to back off. Those symptoms don't go away. What do you do? You guys are getting it. Keep studying. Rapid heart rate. That's another one we're talking about. Okay, so you can get a rapid heart rate when you're exercising. You want to see a gradual increase, but not too much. You know, where you're feeling, because dizziness or lightheadedness or chest pain or shortness of breath can be created by a rapid heart rate that's beyond your normal heart rate. All right? Nausea. Mm. That's a sign something else going on. Usually it's coupled with one of these other symptoms. But if you're nauseated, stop what you're doing. Your body's saying, I'm not feeling good. You need to stop. Extreme fatigue. Extreme fatigue. That's a sign that heart is not happy and you need to stop. If the fatigue doesn't resolve, and you're not, you know, after you're getting hydrated, then you need to seek some medical help. So yeah, it says here, stop, exercise immediately, and call 911 if any of those symptoms occur. So that's why you carry your phone with you if you're out, outside exercising. Any questions so far? Yeah. Yes. Would you please explain the difference between what women's symptoms are versus men's? You mean in regards to chest pain? Yes. Okay. Because chest pain and nausea can be very bad for the women. They can. They can. Women and men. Um, I mean, there are so many different varieties of angina, 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 angina that people can experience between either men, women, and both sexes can have these symptoms. So. Let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about what does angina mean? It means that the heart is not getting enough oxygen to survive, or what it means, it's not getting enough oxygen. So a lack of oxygen anywhere in the body will cause pain. Like you've got lack of blood flow to the legs can cause pain or claudication. So if the heart's not getting enough oxygen, it can cause many different symptoms. Angina can be right here in the center of the chest, pressure like an elephant is standing on it. It can be a sharp pain. It can go up the neck into the jaw. It can go down one or both arms. It can be in between the shoulder blades. And sometimes it can just be shortness of breath. Ladies with diabetes, oftentimes their only symptom of heart issues is just this vague shortness of breath. So it kind of makes you nervous, doesn't it? Sometimes I feel like, oh, you know, how do you know whether it's heart or not? That's why we see the doctor regularly. We let them know of any symptoms we're having so they can investigate what's going on. Is this a heart issue or is this something else? You always want to make sure you're checking out those vital organs first before you move to the, the next diagnostics. Check and make sure, you know, what's life sustaining? How are the, how's the heart? How's the head? How are the kidneys? How are the major organs going? And then move on to other things. But yeah, check in that heart first. If you're having vague symptoms like that, shortness of breath, nausea, coupled together like that, yeah. That, could very well be hard. Yeah. How can the heart rate be increased? The heart rate through exercise? You want to know like other things that can cause it to increase? Um, yeah. Okay. Exercise is one mm -hmm. because the, bo the body needs to get the blood to all the tissues to do the work. So the heart starts pumping faster. Nerves, anxious, can make the heart rate elevate. Fever can elevate. Um, what else can you elevate? Um, thyroid condition, like hyperthyroid can make it elevate. Those are some of them. I can't
can't say that's a complete <laughs> list. I'd have to look that one up. Heat. Thank you. Anything else, Tiffany, you can think of? Heat is another one. Heat's another one, yes. Right now that's, it's a good. Yeah, that's why when you're out, the, that's why I'm recommending not exercising the high heat. If it's above 80, I say uh, not outside. Um, because yeah, the heart's got to work to get, deliver the blood to the body, but it also needs to vasodilate. Those, those vessels have to open up to release heat from the system, so then your heart's working harder to get it done. <laughs> That's another key, too, that reminds me, is making sure you're staying well hydrated when you're exercising, because your body needs water, hydration to function. It doesn't have to be Gatorade, necessarily. Plain cold water is just fine, unless you're like an endurance athlete, and you start needing to replace electrolytes. But one of the things that, I, that I've noted, and you, know, you read it in research as well, as we get older, our sense of thirst diminishes. So when you are thirsty, you're starting to get on the edge of dehydration. So make sure, you're, make sure you are hydrating yourself sufficiently while you're exercising and throughout the day, even when you aren't exercising. Any other questions? Okay, well, we have a few minutes. Um, I've also handed out this beautiful little handout that Tiffany printed out, Eating for a Healthier Heart. So it's a two-pager, and um, when we're talking about heart disease, it's a little bit more about heart disease, um, what leads up to heart disease. Things, things that lead to heart disease are called risk factors. Can anybody tell me what they know to be a risk factor for heart disease? Diabetes. Yep. What's another one? No exercise. Inactivity, sedentary lifestyle. <laughs> uh oh, someone's being <laughs> pointing some fingers. <laughs> okay. What's another one? Overweight. Obesity. Yep. Smoking. Big one. What's another one? Chewing. Chewing. Chewing tobacco. A mm, little bit of nicotine. We're looking at more smoking. Um, High cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, inactivity, overweight, did I miss any? Family. Hypertension. Family history. Family history. Oh, can't do nothing about that. <laughs> can't change in our relatives. <laughs> so we do the best we can. Even if we got a bad family history for heart disease, you do the best you can. Because it, it increases your chances of having a longer, longer, healthier life if you exercise and follow your doctor's instructions about what to do about it. They will, if you've got heart disease, we've got to manage all of our risk factors. So, if someone's got high cholesterol, what do we do? Try to lower it. How do you lower cholesterol? Take a statin. Take a statin and monitor your diet. So that's one of the things on here, eating for a healthier diet. Looking at foods that help reduce your cholesterol intake and your healthier, unhealthy fats. Um, statins, it's a good question. Some people don't like statins because they're worried about side effects. Statins help reduce cholesterol, but most importantly, they help reduce the inflammatory process that leads up to heart disease. So that's what the reason for statins are, they're twofold. But you can reduce your dietary, reduce your cholesterol to a point through dietary approaches. So, um, whole grains are important for lower cholesterol. Um, eating monounsaturated fats, healthy fat like avocado is very important. Olive oil, very good oil to use if you've got heart disease. Or if you don't have heart disease, to help prevent it from happening. I have a question about the eggs. Remember how we told us about eggs? <laughs> eggs, I don't know if they're like either the enemy or they're good. It goes back and forth. I asked I asked a cardiologist, four eggs a week are okay. It depends. I mean, it depends on what day you read the article, right? Because the research changes all the time. So yeah. Tiffany is our go-to for dietary instruction. What would you say is the most recent information on egg consumption? Um, egg consumption is good. So up to two eggs a day actually has no effect on your cholesterol. However, it's an individual basis. So some people are a little bit more sensitive to dietary cholesterol than other people. Um, but for the majority, up to two eggs per day is okay. That's because egg yolks also contain other vitamins and minerals that help balance out the cholesterol that it contains. So there's more good than harm essentially in the egg. So that's why more people are now saying eat your eggs because there's more good in it than there is potential harm from the egg. 
the, uh, the reason why we stopped eating eggs is from, uh, it's called the nurse study. So back in like the early 80s, I think it was, they did a study that showed that as soon as overseas, we implemented eggs into these diets of different Asian cultures, their prevalence of heart disease went up. But it was actually the introductory of fast food that contained eggs. So not all other factors were controlled to make it actually a very good study. Since then, they haven't really repeated it. So there's not another big study like that out there, but a lot of our information is a little bit outdated. But more recent information is saying two eggs a day, generally good for most people. Yeah, if you've got super high cholesterol, because sometimes patients will have a family history of hyper, uh, hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia or hypertri... <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm having a... Um, what's the one that starts? The triglycerides. Yeah. There's a mm -hmm. moment there. Um, Hypertriglyceridemia. There's, there's lots of different fats that are, are implicated in heart disease. So. Your doctor is the best guy. They will put you on medication as a preventative for the inflammatory, you know, decrease the inflammatory effect on the, the heart disease. But um, yeah, that's that's good to know that people are allowed two eggs a day. That's, yeah. that's very reasonable. Because yeah, those yolks are very rich in nutrients that are important for you. Um, the other fats that are important are nut fats, walnuts, um, pecans, um, walnuts, but yeah, walnuts out here, walnuts and almonds. Mm -hmm. And pecans are good nuts to have because they've got a lot of anti uh, fiber and micronutrient nutrients. Put magnesium here. Magnesium is one of those um, chemicals in the body that are important for heart health, too. The taste of nuts is responsible for that. Are they not good for you? They're okay, but I think the walnuts and the pecans and the almonds are the ones that are higher in the, in the, the nutrients that you're looking for. They're certainly okay. Um, almonds, oh yeah, here's almonds on the second page. Seeds also. I'm sorry? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, because nuts, while they're healthy, can be calorie dense. So if someone's really trying to watch their weight, you don't want to be shoveling back handfuls of nuts. Um, and also limiting the salt on those nuts is important too. But a quarter cup of nuts is considered a serving size, or it's a handful. So that's a good way, you know, you know, you know good way to measure it out if you're not like getting out all the cups to measure. <laughs> Like a big hand and a <laughs> cup of nuts. Um, but yeah, a quarter cup is a serving size, and it's about 160, 170 calories. But make sure that you stick with the low salt or the no sodium at all. Your palate will adjust. Sodium is one of those things that we don't want to have a whole lot of in our diet, even if you don't have heart disease or high blood pressure. Um, we as, uh, as adults don't need that much sodium. 2,000 milligrams a day or less is sufficient amount of sodium to have in your body for, for healthy function. Any more than that, it's leading up to hypertension, and then you know, we've got a whole, whole other ball of wax in real life. Uh, let's see, anything else on here? Whole grains, berries, tis the season to get your berries in. Those are very healthy antioxidant foods. Blueberries, strawberries, very high in nutrients, and they're very available this time of year. And tasty. Very high in fiber as well. So when you're talking about controlling your cholesterol, you want to increase your fiber intake. Having more fiber from berries, nuts and seeds, whole grains, leafy uh, veggies, it's going to be important because when you consume cholesterol foods, that fiber is going to help shuttle that cholesterol out of your body and not let it linger there. So if you're going to eat something that has a little bit of cholesterol in it, think about adding it with a very high fiber leafy greens or something like that so your body doesn't store onto that excess cholesterol it doesn't need. If you ever have questions about diet, please, like a wealth of knowledge. Did you guys know that? <laughs> so a lot of them have been Don't coming to my lectures. So. <laughs> These are recurring people that come to the lectures. Yes, so. you're all very good mm. students. It's interesting um, to observe yeah, yeah. So who shows up. Um, any other questions? You've been a great, very involved audience. I appreciate you and all your questions. Yeah. I've got a question regarding blood pressure. Okay. I've, I've had blood pressure, high blood pressure in the past. I consult with diet and some, some medication and exercise. But now, it's, I, I, I feel that the ideal blood pressure is like around 110, below 120. But now it's dropping down to 90. Wow. So I don't know where. Where, where does low blood pressure come from? Okay, out? so when we're talking numbers, that's interesting because people, people, we're very naturally get uh, 
concerned with numbers, because you want to know, is this okay? Is this too low? Is this too high? So, doctors typically will look at blood pressure and say, how's the patient feeling? If someone's lightheaded or dizzy, obviously something's going on. It could be low blood pressure, it could be other things, it could be blood sugar, but if a person's on blood pressure medications, and say it's a patient I'm working with, and they come in and their pressure's 90 over 50, and they're like, I am wiped out, I am so lightheaded. I'm like, well, you're not tolerating that pressure. Lower is considered healthier, but you don't want to have it too low. So, if you're feeling okay and it's 90 over whatever, and your doctor's okay with that number, then it's because you've gotten more fit. Some people, you know, they're on their medication, they're following their diet, then they start a regular exercise program, then they notice over time their blood pressure starts to go down because you're getting more fit. The body's appreciating your efforts. And maybe sometimes the doctor will back off. If you're at 90, maybe they'll say, hey, you don't need so much medication, let's back off. Don't ever do that yourself, right? We all know, we don't mess with our meds. <laughs> without talking over it with your physician, because you know, it's, it's common sense. So um, if you're concerned about it, you could certainly talk with your doctor, say, hey, is this, is this a concern? Can I back off on medications? You know, um, without knowing who your doctor is, what your meds are, what your background is, it would be not wise for me to make any sort of advice. But I always say, check with your doctor first. It could just be, you've gotten in better condition and your blood vessels are healthier and they're, they're not needing. You know, they're, they're doing well. They're happy. I'm not concerned about now. I'm concerned about, oh, that's going to drop lower. So oh. I'm just keeping. Yeah. A sudden day. drop sometimes can, can happen. You know, sometimes if we're not drinking enough fluids, we can get a little dehydrated and that number will go lower. Um, particularly if you're on diuretics, sometimes that can happen too. You dip down too mm -hmm. low. But um, always keep an eye on how you're feeling. That's pretty much a general guideline. If something hurts, if you're not feeling well, pay attention to it. Let your doctor know these symptoms. We have a question. Yeah. At the end of service, can the baby be aware that that's the baby going into the heart? No. I've heard about transposition of vessels. There are, um, I'm not really familiar with pediatric issues and cardiovascular disease. Um, I know that babies can be born with, um, uh, they can have a hole in between the, the muscle that comes down through the middle of the heart. It's called a, a PFA, a patent foramen ovale. So the blood kind of crosses from one side to the other and it's not supposed to. They can have the vessel switched. This is if the baby goes to heart and then the baby Born into mycosis. Oh, yeah, it's called the transposition of the great vessels. So the aorta and the pulmonary, the aorta is that big vessel that comes out of the heart to deliver the blood to the body. And then there's the pulmonary, um, the pulmonary artery that sends the blood to the lungs from the heart. Sometimes those are switched and they have to switch them back. They, they put them put these in the hospital. It's amazing, isn't it? Sure is, yeah, yeah. Thank heavens, they can.